47 immediately came to mind because of how how it ties all of scripture together. So this book, this book right here is 3,500 years old. It has 40 different authors and it wasn't all put together at the same time. And it took about 1,500 years to write it. And they weren't all put together at the same time. It, it all came together the way that we have it today in a way that we can all read it today. In about the last 300 years, before that, you had to be immensely rich to own your own copy of the Bible. If you wanted to own an original King James Bible before it became available for everyone, it would have cost you in the neighborhood of $10,000 of today's money. It's extremely expensive. It wasn't until about two, three hundred years ago that they came out with binding methods that let you have one of these in your own hands. Well, the passage that we're going to today is in the Old Testament, and I'm going to read it for you right now. It's Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 through 12. Let me, re let me read this for y'all and then tell you about it. Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 12. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple. And behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar, and he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the water was trickling on the south side. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits. It's about three quarters of a mile measured a thousand cubits, and then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. Again he measured a thousand, led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again he measured a thousand, and he led me through the water, and it was waist deep. And again he measured a thousand, and the river was that I could not pass through. The water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? And then he led me back to the bank of the river, and I went back. And I saw on the banks of the river very many trees on one side and on the other. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern regions and goes down into the Arabah. That's the, the Dead Sea. And he enters the sea. And when the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. Wherever the river goes, everything, every living thing that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish. For the water that goes there uh, for this water goes there, that the water of the sea might become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea from Ein Gedi to Engalam, and will be a place for the spreading of nets. The fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea, but its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They're to be left for salt. On the banks and on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail, but they will, be, they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. And that is our passage for this morning. Kind of a strange passage to just pull out and say, this is my favorite passage of the Bible. I, I hope by the end of this that some of you in this room, this will be your favorite passage as well. See, Ezekiel is a prophet. Okay, and let me, let me set the stage for you. In the Old Testament, we need to keep in mind that the Old Testament is just a dress rehearsal for the New Covenant. The entire Old Testament, uh, from the books of history to the prophets to the poetry, it's all a dress rehearsal for the New Covenant. The New Testament, you can think of it except for the Gospels, is a commentary on the Old Testament. The New Testament writers did not have the New Testament to preach from. They were writing it. So they preach from the Old Testament. How are they supposed to make the teachings of Jesus and the realities of the prophets real to the people in light of Jesus coming? They preach from the Old Testament. They preach from the prophets like Ezekiel in light of Jesus' revelation and what he did. And this is one of those amazing passages. So the first part of Ezekiel deals with the prophecy of Ezekiel being Israel and Jerusalem and Judah, you have turned away from God to a point where God said, enough is enough. 
I have whistled and called Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon to destroy you. And so the first part of Ezekiel deals with Ezekiel having to tell the people that are in exile with him that their home is going to be destroyed. God's had enough. Their idolatry and their adultery to God has gone so far that God will destroy them. Some will be killed with a sword. Their city will be destroyed. The temple will be destroyed. And Ezekiel does this by play acting. One of the incidents that I think is fun that God told him he needed to build a model of Jerusalem, a small scale model, and besiege it himself. So you can picture a, a prophet dressed in you know, ancient Israeli garb, building a sandcastle version of Jerusalem. And, you know, and, and the people are looking at him and God warns them, they're not going to listen to you. But I want you to do this anyway. He makes Ezekiel lay on his side naked and eat food cooked over dung as a symbol of what the people of Jerusalem are going to go through when God finally sends, the pe sends Babylon to destroy it. So Ezekiel play acted all of these prophecies and some of the prophecies he had visions. Well, it came to pass, right? Ezekiel was taken into exile about 10 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's preaching these things 10 years before Babylon is coming to destroy Jerusalem. Well, right before the second part of Ezekiel, Jerusalem is destroyed. And a refugee coming in from Jerusalem, tattered clothing, dirty with all the other refugees, comes in and tells Ezekiel, your prophecy came true. Jerusalem's been besieged and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And the second part of the book begins. And now Ezekiel's prophecy is hope for the future. Hope for the future of Israel, that God will restore them to their land and that he will restore their fortunes. Now remember, he, he told Jeremiah and he told the other prophets that I'm going to send you an exile, but it'll be for 70 years. So Ezekiel reiterates these things. Now this passage that I read to you is deeply symbolic. It's deeply symbolic. We're not talking about a, a physical complex here. What I want to explain this is that sometimes in prophecy, especially biblical prophecy, the Old Testament being a dress rehearsal for the new, it gives us physical representations of a spiritual reality. Because we're visual creatures. When we see something, we want to relate it to something else. So sometimes when God gives men in the Bible a vision, he gives them a vision of something that's relatable to them, something that they can understand. Sometimes he doesn't, but most of the time the visions relate to something. So when Ezekiel sees this new temple complex and he sees this, this river flowing from the sanctuary, he's actually seeing these things in his vision. He says, I looked and I saw. Or this man showed me. This man did this. And the man in the passage is an angel. But he's seeing these things, but they're corresponding to a spiritual reality. A great example of this is just a couple chapters earlier in Ezekiel 37. Who's familiar with the Valley of Dry Bones? Yeah, quite a few people. So Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. So in the vision, Ezekiel sees a valley filled with dry, cracked bones of all these people. And it's just, it's, it's a graveyard. And a wind blows and the bones start to rattle and they start to stand up. And he watches as new tissue and sinew and joints and marrow and, and skin grows. And he sees a group of new people standing in front of him. Did that actually happen? No, it was a vision that he was shown. But it represented how God is going to not only restore the people of Israel to their, to their kingdom of Israel after their exile. It also was a picture of the new covenant where God would restore us who are dead in our trespasses and sins and the Holy Spirit would come and make us alive. So Ezekiel is shown something, a physical thing that he sees but that is a spiritual reality. Another good example of this is in Daniel. We actually talked a little bit about Daniel this morning in our Bible study. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a, of a large statue. And this is a pagan king. But he had a dream of a statue which represented four nations. But he actually saw a statue in his dream. 
but it didn't represent a real statue. It represented four world empires that would be destroyed. So that's kind of what we're looking at here in Ezekiel 47. We're looking at something that Ezekiel the prophet is seeing, and it means something for us spiritually, and it means something physically for later. The next thing I want you guys to understand is the water flowing from the temple. Okay, there's a 40 through chapter 40 through 48 of Ezekiel talk about this huge temple that Ezekiel is, is being shown. We're not going to go through the whole thing. It's tedious. It's... <laughs> but this is the crux of it here, chapter 47, and what results from this temple that he's seeing. See, the temple in the Bible is incredibly symbolic. It is a physical reality that God gives to us to express a spiritual reality. See, in the Old Testament, we have three temples. I say three um, because I consider the tabernacle and Solomon's temple and the second temple to be the same thing. Okay, we have, they're, they're different physical locations and different sizes, but it's the same system of worship. The other one, the first temple that we see on earth is the garden, the Garden of Eden. And that's why I've, I've labeled this sermon Paradise Lost and Found, because the Garden of Eden was our first temple on earth. God dwelt with man. And the tabernacle that he gives to the Hebrews is called the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, because the tabernacle is to dwell amongst. And God came and dwelt amongst his people. And so we go to the Garden of Eden, and we see that God prepares this garden in the midst of the whole world, places Adam and Eve in it, and he gives Adam the right to be the first priest king, where he's to have dominion over the face of the earth. And he's to extend and work the boundaries of the garden like the priest would work the tabernacle. He was to work the garden and extend its boundaries to the ends of the earth. The goal was fill the earth with Eden. And he failed. He failed that mandate. And instead of taking dominion, man became subjected to sin. And because of sin came death. And we were exiled from the presence of God we were exiled from the first temple and then the temple was destroyed in the flood. And then the tabernacle is the next one. The tabernacle is the, f and, and the first and second temple, Solomon's temple and Herod's temple. It's the tent of meeting, right? I'm going to go through these. If you want more clarification later, I'm more than happy to talk to you about them, but they had articles in the temple. Pretend that this is the, the back part of the tent and the entrance over there is the beginning part of the tent. Well, you walk in, there's one entrance. Right? Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and the life. I am the gate of the sheep. And so the gate of the tabernacle represents Jesus. And then you walk in, and the first thing you come in contact with is the altar of sacrifice. Because you can't go into God's presence without atonement for sin. And so the first thing when you walk in through the gate, you see this bloody bronze altar stinking of rotten meat and burning meat because you have to come face to face with your sins before entering the presence of God. And so we enter the presence of God, Christ becomes our sacrifice, and the next thing is the wash basin. You have to be washed before entering the presence of God, and before entering into the tent, the priest had to wash himself. And so Christ being the gate, he enters in to the holy places in heaven, and he puts himself on the altar. He makes atonement for sin and cleanses us with his blood as, we re as is represented in our Lord's Supper. And then he enters into the holy place as our new priest king. As our new priest king. The second Adam. The one who didn't fail in his mandate. And then, as he enters in, there's articles on the left and to the right and to the center when he walks in. And we have the, uh, we have the lamp stand, the table of bread, the table of showbread, which is the presence of the 12 tribes of Israel in the presence of God because they couldn't physically be there. The lamp stand, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. And then there's the altar of incense before the veil. The altar of incense is a pleasing aroma before God, and Christ became a pleasing aroma and our intercessor before God. And he, the high priest, making intercession for us, enters into the, holy, the holiest place where the Ark of the Covenant is where the mercy seat is. And that's where the presence of God physically dwelt with the Israelites. Inside that mercy seat was the, uh, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's staff, which was a symbol of priesthood, and the manna, 
the bread from heaven. And Jesus said he's the bread from heaven. And so the whole temple, the whole tabernacle, the whole system that God gave to the Israelites is a massive dress rehearsal for the new covenant. And here we see water flowing from this temple. See, Christ has fulfilled this covenant. Is there a temple here today? There's no temple. Titus got rid of that 2,000 years ago. There's no temple on earth today. So how is this new covenant being fulfilled? It's being fulfilled in you. It's being fulfilled in every single believer. Let's walk through this very briefly. Verses 1 through 2. He brought me back to the door of the temple. Water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east because the temple faced east. By the way, Eden faced east. The entrance that they were kicked out of was east. The river in Eden <laughs> flowed east. The temple in Israel, all of them faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar, and brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around. Basically what this is saying is there's water trickling from... If this is the entrance to the sanctuary, it's trickling down like this, coming down around the side, and then out east. It's a long way around about of explaining it, but the water's flowing down the threshold like this and then going east. So water's flowing out of the temple into the world. In Genesis 2.10, it says, A river flowed out of Eden, the water of the garden, and uh, the, that watered the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers that went out into the world. In Genesis 3, it says, He drove out man, and at the east of the garden gate, Eden, he placed the cherubim a flaming sword and turned every way to guard the entrance and the way to the tree of life. So Ezekiel's temple in these first two verses, it has water flowing from the sanctuary towards the east into the outer world, just like Eden. In verses 3 through 6, we have this picture of it getting deeper and deeper. So we have a, a measuring line, like a giant tape measure. And this angel measures a thousand cubits or three quarters of a mile. And he walks through it and it's ankle deep. And then it's knee deep. And then it's waist deep. And then he can't go any farther because you have to swim in it. It's a river. And this river starts as a trickle out of the sanctuary. And as it flows out into the world becomes this great flowing river that can't be passed through. And so this river starts as a trickle but flows from the temple, from the sanctuary into the outer world and it gets wider and deeper. Now, verses 7 through 9, the river coming from the sanctuary brings life to everything it touches and everything that lives, lives near the river. Everything that lives, lives near this river as it's flowing from the sanctuary. And then verses 10 through 12. Fishermen, fruit, destruction. Let me read that, verses 10 through 12. Fishermen will stand beside the sea from Ein Gedi to Engelam and will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea, but its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are left for salt. When it says in the Bible that something is left for salt, back in the day, armies would salt the earth where crops were for their enemies so that they couldn't grow again. Salt destroys crops. You can't plant on salted earth. So when it says those places are left for salt, it's simply saying that there's a part where this river of living water doesn't touch, and those areas are left for destruction. They're, they stay swamps and quagmires, and there's no life there. But everything that does live, lives near the river, is sustained by the river, because there's trees that grow by the river. And it, if we continue on, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. How many times did Jesus talk about trees and fruit? We talked about it this morning with mustard trees. And this is where we need to look at something that Jesus said uh, at the parable. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Fishermen, fruit, and destruction. That's just about sums up the preaching ministry of Jesus Christ while he was on earth. Fishermen, I will make you fishers of men. Fruit, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, destruction. 
So let's look here. Let me put this together. Brothers and sisters, you are the temple spoken of here in Ezekiel's vision. This is not to puff you up. This is not to, to make you think more highly of yourselves than you ought to. But you need to know. Jesus came here to establish his kingdom. And he came out of that water and out of the wilderness after being tempted, saying, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Christ himself, the incarnation of God, dwelt on earth with his people, in the midst of his people. And there's even a prophecy in Isaiah that says the king will suddenly come to his temple. Or in Zechariah, I'm sorry. The king will suddenly come to his temple, and he goes to his temple, and he turns over tables. And he says, this isn't how it's supposed to be. And he pronounces destruction on that temple. But Jesus, the priest king, is sitting on the throne now with authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. And he has been given a kingdom that will never be destroyed. He sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in the hearts of his people, of his believers. Something that was not done in a mass scale in the Old Testament. Only some had the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Sometimes the king, we know David did. Sometimes the prophets or the judges. But the people as a whole, the congregation, the ecclesia, they were not filled with the Holy Spirit. It says in 1 Peter 2, 5 through 6, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices, right? Paul says, make your lives a living sacrifice. God doesn't delight in, in, in sacrifices if your heart is far from him. He says so in, in the prophets. He sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in his people, to tabernacle in his people, Here's what the scripture says. Here's what uh, Peter quotes. It stands in scripture. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, a chosen and precious stone, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so Peter th somehow thinks that the believers of Christ are the priesthood and the stones put together in a spiritual house. And Paul preaches in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. In uh, You are not your own. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? So as the water trickles from the sanctuary and becomes a large river that gets deeper and deeper and fills the earth just as Adam was supposed to do with the Garden of Eden. Now the water that brings life to everything it touches, it flows from the sanctuary. You are the sanctuary. Christ is the high priest. You are a royal priesthood if you are in Christ. Stones built up together as a spiritual house, giving spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. John 4, 13 through 14, our Lord was talking to a Samaritan woman at the well and asks her for water. And he said, if you knew who was asking you for water. And he says, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. That water will well up in him as a spring welling up into eternal life. And John 7, 38, Jesus said, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit. This is still quoting John 7, 38. Rivers of living water. This he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for yet the Spirit had not been given. It was not, Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus hadn't gone to heaven and Pentecost hadn't happened. The Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out yet. So Jesus says his believers will flow forth with rivers of living water. Matthew 13, this is a parable of the kingdom Jesus gives. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. It's very small. 
Very, very small. It's like a very small bead you would put on a bracelet. And uh, the man took it and sowed it in the field, the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is large, uh, larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air make their nests in its branches. And he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. And so Jesus gives this parable about just, just like the river in Ezekiel, right? This is 500 years before Jesus. Just like the parable in Ezekiel, uh, this, this vision that Ezekiel has, this small seed grows and becomes a plant that fills the garden and its branches become a place where the birds flock to for life. And then we have the dough. Leaven starts very small. It's a living thing, and it works through the entire lump. It's like a sourdough starter. Put that in there, and it slowly makes the whole, all that flour into sourdough. And so just like this, the river that's flowing from the sanctuary fills the whole earth, and everything that it touches, everything that lives near it, has life. This all started with 12 disciples, 12 apostles. You and I are in this room because of 12 Hebrew men. Fishermen will stand beside the sea and cast their nets, and their fish will be of many kinds, is what it says in Ezekiel in verse 10. Fishermen will stand beside the sea. And they'll be casting their nets and catching many fish, many kinds of fish. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Matthew 4, 18 through 22, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So Ezekiel is prophesying Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee Picking out Peter and Andrew and James and John. Picking out fishermen and who? This all started with one fisherman. And right there in Israel, spirit flowed forth from Peter at the day of Pentecost. He spread his net to catch men and he caught 3,000. And then 3,000 became 10,000. And then 10,000 became all of Judea, and then all of Judea, 300 years go by. That's not a lot in terms of human history. 300 years go by. This country's not even 300 years old. 300 years go by, a couple generations, and the entire Roman Empire had become the Byzantine Empire. Rome ceased to be Rome and became Christian. And then the entire East, and then the entire West, and all of Europe was ensconced in Christianity. And then we have the small outliers becoming Christian. It did not take very long. 2,000 years is just a drop in the hat of human history. And now all of human history, there's not a piece of land on this earth that has not had the leaven work through it. That the branches have not stretched across. That the river has not flowed through. And yet, there are still swamps and marshes. Just even in, this own, in our own state. In our own country, there's places where the river has not touched and they remain swamps. We go to those places and we share the gospel and we try to dig off the river to go to those places and bring life. And you know what? Not everybody's going to be saved. We know that. Christ tells us as much. But we preach anyway. We keep casting our nets. Revelation 21. This should sound familiar. This should sound familiar. Uh, I'm sorry, Revelation 22, this should sound very familiar. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, and on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. <coughs> No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more, they will need no more lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord their God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So brothers and sisters, what Ezekiel is seeing in a vision 
is spiritual and physical reality for you now. That river is flowing from the sanctuary. It's filling the whole earth. You are representatives of that. You're fishermen by the sea. And us casting our nets is something we should be doing every day within our sphere of influence. Everybody around us, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers. You don't have to go off to a different country. Stand beside the sea where you jumped in or where the water hit you. It's okay, you don't have to go off and be a, a, an evangelist to the entire world. You just need to be an evangelist where you're at. We need to be rivers of water welling up to eternal life because Christ says that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. There's no temple on earth today because Christ has fulfilled it and he has brought the temple here. It's not this building, it's you. He has put his spirit in the hearts of every believer and our hearts will run with rivers of living water and Jesus' parables talk about the kingdom of heaven and the good seed. It's the word, the gospel. So we share the gospel and we make the river wider and deeper. And this is why this is my favorite passage of scripture. Because it brings full circle the entire redemptive history of God. And it was just plopped down in the middle of Ezekiel, chapter 47. Now, this, what I'm teaching you is not new. This is not new theology. This is not new doctrine. This is something that you go read uh, theology books a couple hundred years ago from some covenantal theologians. They'll, they'll say the same thing. It's just something that's kind of been forgotten. We forget who we are and the, the spiritual nature of the prophets. And we, we're always trying to look for the next big prophetic event in the headlines. We've got to stop doing that. Because our job is not to look for what's going to happen later. Our job is to look at what we have to do now. What we have to do now is be fishermen standing beside the sea, casting our nets to catch fish of many kinds. And Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Make disciples of the nations. And the word used there in nations, the Greek is ethnos. All people from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. Everyone. Go share the gospel with every person. It is not for the Hebrews just alone anymore. It is not for Hebrew people alone anymore. It is for every single human being who's called. And who does the calling? We share the gospel. It says in Romans, how will they hear without preaching and preaching through the word of God? It is our job to stand beside the sea and preach. And then we let God change their hearts. We let the valley of dry bones, the, the wind come, the Holy Spirit come and regenerate and change that person's heart. And the last thing I'll leave you with in Ezekiel is Ezekiel's message that God would remove their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. There may be someone in this room, and this is our, our invitation for today, there may be someone in this room who has a heart of stone, who loves their sin more than they love their God. There may be someone here who, oh look, everyone in this room is a sinner. Every single person here once had a heart of stone. And if you were given a heart of flesh, if you repent of your sins and believe in Christ, then you're saved. There's no special thing you have to do. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth and we're saved. And so when we go to Ezekiel, when we go to the prophets, when we go anywhere in scripture, we have to keep in mind that God is giving us his redemptive history. And he has called all men everywhere to repent and turn to him. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for giving us for preserving it for us so that we can read it on our own, so that we can have our own copies. Thank you for the faithful men who were willing to, to die to bring this to us, the ones who wouldn't turn it over to the authorities, the, one who, the, the, the men who refused to, um, to bow down when the governments in, of the world and the nation said, no, you can't read that, you can't have those scriptures. Lord, thank you for those faithful men. Lord, I ask that anyone in this room is struggling if they have a sin that they're having a difficulty letting go of, that you would remove their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh, 
to understand their sin in regards to your holiness. Lord, please write this message on our hearts. Help us be that river of living water to our brothers and sisters around the world, to our brothers and sisters here, our neighbors here in town, our neighbors next door. Lord, give us the boldness and the courage to share the gospel. And I ask that as we go throughout this week, throughout the rest of this month, I ask that you you give us opportunities to share as well. Lord, I pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. If there is, um, if there's anyone here who has made a decision for Christ, I'd love to talk to you and pray with you. If there's anyone here who has more questions, I'll be down here uh, on the front. You're more than welcome to come chit chat or pray. Um, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to choose. Don't harden your heart. Uh, if you're wanting to join the church, I was told JR said that there were um, cards on the back of your seat. If you're new and you, you would like to become members of the church, you can fill those cards out. There are going to be new members classes coming up pretty soon. And uh, for baptisms, if anyone needs a baptism, he told me that uh, they just need to work on scheduling. So you get together with, with Jeff or JR and you can schedule that. And for the rest of the announcements, I'll turn it over to you.